Hello and welcome, everyone. Today is a very special episode brought to you by both the DEI Is podcast and this queer book, Save My Life. I'm Enrico E. Manalo, host of the DEI Is podcast. Co-hosting this episode today with me is the host of this queer book, Save My Life, J.P. Derebohosian. Books are so ubiquitous that we almost take them for granted, but in a very real sense, they are part of so many of our stories as human beings, not just our personal histories, but the stories that we write ourselves into as we each navigate the complexity of the times we live in. Here today to talk books and human-centered workplace cultures is the CEO and founder of Hummingbird Humanity, Brian McComack. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Diverity PBC, especially Minson Kebers, Jay Patel, and Luis Espinoza, the kind folks at Hummingbird Humanity, including Mark Travis Rivera, or the Mark Travis Rivera, as I like to call him, and Lindsay Morton, and of course, executive producer of This Queer Book Saved My Life, Jim Pounds, and the folks at Normandale Community College that enabled JP enough space in his busy schedule to put this podcast episode together with me. Brian and JP, how are you today? Oh, I'm great. It's so good to be here with you both. And I, I, I think I must be super special because I have two podcast hosts together. <laughs> so like, I'm not that hard to manage, but uh, no, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. Likewise, I'm really happy to be here and to introduce the listeners of This Queer Book Saved My Life to DEI Is, which is a fantastic podcast that I have subscribed to for a while now. And so I'm glad and I hope that all of my listeners will keep joining in because there's some really lovely work that happens here. Great. So, uh, JP, I think I'll hand it over to you. Uh, well, excuse me, I have an audience question. So uh, before we hand it over to JP, which books, queer or otherwise, saved your life? And I will pop that up on the screen so that people can respond. So over to you, JP. Yes. So I have notes to keep me on track today because I know that this is a great conversation to have. So I've got some notes with me. Um, Brian, your forthcoming book, Humanity in the Workplace, a framework for developing a human-centered culture, very important, coming out next June the 6th, 2023, um, which is also Pride Month. Um, so how did it come to be, so to speak? Give us that backstory. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I, I want to just, uh, the, I feel like I have to start with like, and this is sort of one of the, not sort of, this is one of the things that we believe in at Hummingbird is uh, amplifying the voices of others. Um, and so just to, to answer the, like, which, which book saved my life, I, I, I still have to think about if there's a queer book that saved my life. I do love um, Anne Rice's son. I think it's Christopher Rice, if I remember correctly. I've read all of his books. I'm not sure they saved my life, but they're brilliant. Um, and uh, Tuesdays with Maury um, is uh, is the book that, that really has really captured my heart and soul, along with The Last Lecture. Um, and those, those are two books that I highly recommend to anyone at any point in your adult life, um, maybe even in your, you know, if you're a little younger than your adult life, uh, those, those books have a lot of meaning and purpose to them. Um, and, uh, um, and I should say Anne Rice's son is part of our community as well. So, um, so, so the, 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 that fits the queer side. And then we have, uh, the two other books that I have, have really fed into how I think about life and work, um, and, you know, are part of the, the book that I, um, still can't believe that. I've written and that is coming to a bookstore near you by that I mean online.com sites um, and uh, you know how did how did I get here um, you know back in college I read a book called the customer comes second by Hal Rosenbluth I always like to just acknowledge that because because that book um, of course College was a long time ago. We're going to skip the number of years because I'm still 25. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, but me too. It really, <laughs> exactly, me too. We're all we're all just 25. We're forever. Um, thank goodness for plastic surgery. So um, the uh, that book is is the concept of that book, which has been the guiding. I haven't read it since college, but it, the, the what I what I received from it was. Uh, that the best way to run a company is to create a workplace, and this is the language I use today, where humans thrive. Um, and if you do that, then your customers or your clients, they're going to benefit from that. But 
but so often we focus on the profit margins or the, the you know the Excel spreadsheets um, and not enough on the people, the humans that work in our companies. Um, and that was really Hal's message. Um, and that's really been the guiding force behind my my career as an HR person, as a DEI person, um, as a manager, a leader. Um, and I won't claim that I've gotten it wrong or sorry I, I should claim that i've gotten it wrong a lot because it's true i've learned i've made lots of mistakes over the the course of my career and have had people that have trusted me and respected me enough to give me tough feedback and help me grow and learn um and you know that that journey has led to this you know as my my lived experiences as a gay man and a, a disabled person um and my professional experiences and organizational change and workplace culture um hr and dei um, have led to this work that i get to do today and my perspective on how do we bring to life human-centered workplace cultures um so yep yeah, releasing it next june um it's not a coincidence that it's pride month because i am gay uh, <laughs> Just, I heard that somewhere. <laughs> just, you know, it's it's sort of like all over the place now. So I, there, I, you know, I, I will say just, and I'll, I'll pause for a second. But if you would have asked me twenty five years ago, I guess I did give away the age uh, when I started my HR career. Would I be on a podcast or writing a book or like sharing the fact about the fact that all of these public forums that I'm a gay person? I, I would have said there is no way in H-E double mm -hmm. hockey sticks and um, mm -hmm. it's still surreal to me. So I'm, I'm delighted to, that I get to do this and hopefully we can make workplaces better for everyone. I hear that. I hear that. Can I ask a follow-up question? So I've read on your blog and you, you were just talking about the, the believer of the workplace culture and the human-centered workplace. Can you give us more about that? Like what's the foundation of that belief, the, the human-centered workplace culture? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Um, you know, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, um, having been an HR person and a DEI person um, and an organizational change person. And um, and what I'm about to say will be some unpopular with some, but um, but I also believe it's true for most is that HR people generally aren't good culture and DEI people um, and yep. DEI people <laughs> aren't good HR people. Um, 100%. And, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being <laughs> with me. I appreciate that. Um, and, they, and DEI people typically don't have the foundational understanding of enterprise working and organizational change, um, which is an, which is what HR people have. And, um, and I think that I love the the introduction, um, that's a that's an unfair word to some degree, but of DEI in our workplaces, it's so important that we acknowledge that systemic oppression is real and that we um, mm -hmm. say it out loud so we can tear down those barriers and roadblocks uh, that marginalize others and create better systems. Um, I also think that DEI is too narrow in its focus and the way we've brought it to workplaces. So my suggestion is that um, to really ignite the heart and soul of the people that work at an organization, um, we should, which is developing a human-centered workplace culture, that we should develop a function that is separate from HR, that is responsible for social impact, holistic well-being, DEI, um, transparent communications, um, which is in partnership with a true internal communications department, um, and human-centered leadership. How are we fostering human-centered leaders? Sometimes, um, so I think some organizations might put employee experience in that as well. Mm -hmm. And then HR is a human capital function that is managing the resource of humans and companies. And it's so important that they do that. Um, but I think we need to separate those um, where, when possible to make sure that we're igniting both the management of human capital as well as the heart and soul which drives our companies. I love this articulation. And, you know, I've heard so much frustration from uh, people interested in uh, working in DEI and they're looking for these organizational roles and they're reading the job description. And it's like, hey, wait a minute, this is an HR function, right? And so you see these companies like, why can't we get good deep DEI people? Like, because you're asking for HR people. And as you've just walked us through, they're, they're not the same, nor should we like lump them together, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's worth saying that um, our educational cultures kind of predispose us toward hyper-specialization, which does mean that there is a great diversity of specialization out in the world, but unless they can work together, then that specialization really doesn't lead us anywhere. So, you know, yet another reason why we need to understand diversity more fully and how things fit together 
for the human being because otherwise we end up with workplaces that oppress people and dehumanize and we're seeing the the results of that uh, so my follow-up question to the audience is, what was one clear indicator in your personal and professional journey that told you you were on, quote, the right path? And for clarity's sake here, or transparency, I'm not 100% sure that I am on the right path either. The way that I think about <laughs> DEI is evolving. I've been gravitating toward, uh, you know, billing myself as like a, an anti-oppression person, but I, I still feel like that's kind of incomplete as far as the impact that I like to have. So we're just really curious to see uh, what others are thinking as well. Uh, so Brian, you mentioned that on your professional journey, you found yourself in a situation. Well, I, I should say that uh, Brian said this to us uh, as we were preparing for the show. You mentioned that you were on uh, in a situation where you felt it was necessary to go back in the closet, which I imagine must have been very painful. Uh, and so knowing what you know now, how might you have asked someone to better support you along your journey? Or how might you have advised your past self's team and leadership so that they could offer the support that you now know you needed? Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and just to, to for all of you who are with us or, or watching later or listening later, um, uh, so I, I came out in my early 20s um, and it was as I was wrapping up college and um, and I had worked at um, AMC theaters since high school and I went full time with AMC after college and um, that environment as as my experience in service environments, um, frontline environments like retail stores and restaurants and hotels, th those are environments that I, my experience has led me to say, like, it's okay to be you in those environments. Um, but I went back to school to get my master's degree in human resources and change management um, and uh, got an internship um, at uh, Red Lobster, which at the time was owned by Darden Restaurants. And um, and this is nothing, you know, my, my decision to go back in the closet has nothing to do with that company. It a, was a great company. Um, but I, the world around me, the messages, no, nobody said it explicitly, but I heard the messages that you should be careful being you when you walk in that mm -hmm. door. Um, and there's two things I talk about. One is I also knew that I should take off, as I call it, my coat of emotions. Like I'm not supposed to bring emotion with me. I walk into this workplace mm -hmm. and I just have to be the, the robot that that uh, is expected to do this job that's on this job description. Um, so I knew that, but again, nobody said it. And the other was, it may not be safe to be gay here. Um, and so I went back in the closet uh, when I stepped into that, that job. Now, I was incredibly fortunate. And so I think maybe this is where the you know, the, 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 hopefully the experience might be helpful to others. Um, the, one of the managers that I worked with in that department, it was the employee relations or Red Lobster, we called it crew relations. Um, the crew relations team, um, one of those managers was a rising star in the company who was an openly gay man. Um, and, uh, he quickly figured out that I had something to share. Um, and he made it a point to talk, which I think he also would have done anyway, cause that's just who he was, but he was talking about his husband. And so all of a sudden I'm like, oh, <laughs> I can talk about who I am. And, um, and we talked about that. And not only did he share a little bit about his journey and how safe he felt being himself at Red Lobster, he also was able to help share uh, other senior leaders at the company who were out and publicly out and had chosen to share their stories, um, including someone who was as identified as the successor to our CEO, which was also public knowledge. Um, and so very quickly, and in that first job, I knew that it was okay to be me um, day to day because I worked with someone who was like me. And I also knew that I could have a career journey because there was someone at the top levels of the company who was like me as well. And, you know, that was a really powerful experience for me that, you know, so much so that I, I'm talking about it a few years later, <laughs> quote unquote, a few. Um, and, um, <laughs> You know, and it's one of the one of the reasons that um, you know some something that people follow my LinkedIn channel for is uh, I I have a series that I've been posting about um, for about three years now called Representation Matters, um, and really the the idea of representation matters. And what I post is I want to expand the conversation about representation. Yes, it is about who works at your company, but it's also about do people see themselves in your company. Yeah. 
in your benefits and your leadership teams and your advertisements and so on. So I try to celebrate when we see those moments of representation, but it's all anchored in that moment when I was 24, started at Red Lobster, went back in the closet and had Kim, Kim Shave is his name, um, help me be me, help me know it was okay to be me. Wow. So we talk about belonging a lot in these kinds of, uh, you know, DEI, uh, you know, it's growing, people add access, belonging, you know, but um, even if you build a place that on paper is like, yeah, anybody can come here unless they really feel at home, then that's just straight up not going to happen, right? There's no field of dreams when it comes to, uh, to organizations, <laughs> right? If you build it, so what, basically. Um, so, I mean, I guess a follow-up question that I might have is, um, you know, you, you mentioned it's been a few years since that happened to you. And so uh, I, I imagine that, <laughs> quote unquote, right? Quote unquote, but, a few. I mean, I, I'm just kind of wondering what it's like to, to see uh, all the societal changes um, that have happened, right? So like going from into this situation where it's clear to you that like, oh, maybe I need to be a little bit cautious here. And you're seeing newer generations, younger generations rather, of, of people identifying as queer, LGBTQIA+, um, in, in relatively a short time, right? So I don't know, are, are there people that you'd like to understand now that there are like multiple generations of queer people living in the world, but the world is still kind of struggling to, uh, to handle the complexity of, of difference in general? Mm. <clears throat> so you know, one thing that I'll offer that um, to start this is, um, so for those of you who can't see me, um, I'm a white cisgender man, which of course I, you know, it's important to state that out loud. Um, and with being a white cis man who also i'm I, actually enrico and jp i don't know if you know this i'm also six feet six inches tall so i i have like stature um and i'm heteronormative um although i don't care you know i don't spend energy worrying about that i know that that's where i fit as well so in many ways corporate environments were built for people like me and i can choose to put away the gay part of the conversation if i want to I, um, so I just want to acknowledge there's privilege with my identity, which is not true for every member of the queer community. Um, and, and also that means with what, you know, that's important about what I want to say first is, uh, once I came out, I knew I never wanted to go back in the closet. Um, you know, I come out in my personal life, I came out at AMC, I went back in the closet. I, you know, to your point, Enrico, that didn't feel good. And I don't ever want to feel that way again. So any interviews that I've had since then, I always make sure that the company knows in some way that I'm gay. I don't shout from the rooftops that I'm gay, um, but I find a, a way to make sure they know. And, um, you know, it might be uh, for many years, it would be when I was part of the New York City Gay Men's Chorus, I'd say I'm part of this organization. Now, you don't have to be gay to be part of that organization, but it's a, an assumption that people are going to lead with. And if they don't want me, I don't want to be there. <laughs> um, now, I realize that I have some privilege and that gives me that opportunity. And that's not true for everyone. Um, you know, I, I think that's also what's been interesting for me, though, is um, I'll share I'll share one of my powerful moments of learning. Um, uh, as in this work that I get to do now to be an advocate for others. I was the head of inclusion at Tapestry, which is the home of coach Kate Spade and Stuart Weitzman. I was working with the Pride um, Committee, Pride ERG, on our Pride celebration. And I asked this group of individuals that were predominantly queer people of color, non-binary, transgender, um, um, women. Um, so that was the group that I was with, not people that look like me. And I asked them, like, what, 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 what are you excited about? What do you want to see this year? And um, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I hope that this is what, what they felt. Um, but I, I, I was proud that they, I created the safety enough for them to say, we want it to not be about cisgender gay white guys, mm -hmm. um, which are people that look like me, right? And sure. I'm like, mm -hmm. 
you're so right. Because <laughs> because I, I sort of thought back to all of the things that I had seen and they're like, we want pride to look like us. Um, and so that was a really nice opportunity. They showed me enough trust to share that with me and for me to help them to create those stories and to share those messages um, and to work with our brands to, to bring those messages to life. And the coach brand um, uh, in particular, um, they did a 50 years of pride the following year, centering around queer people of color um, for their celebration. And um, you know, Stuart Weitzman and Kate Spade did wonderful things as well. All of the brands really stepped in. So, you know, that that is, I think, something I continue to think about is how um, how the you know the you know to your point, Enrico, this diversity conversation or inclusion of differences, like I, I gay white guys like me are just a half step below cis white guys, um, and there's a whole range of people that are so diverse that are still trying to find their space in corporate America and truly have the opportunity to succeed, like the world has given me opportunities and. Uh, um, and I'm grateful for those learning moments and I want to continue to, to see how we can can tear down those barriers to, to acceptance and inclusion that allow the, everyone to thrive. Wow, I love that. And thank you for, for sharing. I mean, it should be obvious from the, the acronym that there is diversity within the queer community, but I, I do think that uh, you know, uh, human the human mind is a strange thing. Like we go for simplicity. And so, you know, it's like, oh yeah, that whole acronym, it's Brian, right? <laughs> but it's not. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I so <laughs> represent the breadth of the amazing community that I'm part of. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, but I will also fully acknowledge that I don't, I mean, of course I knew people that were different than me, but I don't think I, until that moment, when someone was brave enough and trusted me enough to say like, hey, we want the rest of the story to be represented, had I thought it thought through it that lens. I wish I could say I was that human. Sometimes people need to help me on my journey too, um, and uh, and so now I really just try to lean into that, and um, which is part of where you know coming back to the amplifying voices of the unheard um, is part of our is our mission at Hummingbird is um, my, I have space for my voice and I'm grateful for that and I want to use my voice to help others. Mm -hmm. JP, I wonder if you'd like to to jump in on this question as well, and if not, of course. No, yeah, it's it's. I was in a, so, you know, I mean, we're not giving our way ages, right? We're 25. Uh, but to, to, to be coming of age, I think, you know, in the 90s and then beginning my professional career in the aughts, right? When there was all this legislation that was, you know, we, we, were, we were out, but we weren't out, if that makes sense. Like we were still like pushing. And then over the past 20 years to see all of this progress and now to just be facing this wave of legislative bans, right, yeah. coming at us and, and, you know, not to plug an episode from this queer book, Save My Life, but I was talking you're gonna about- You're going to plug an episode. I'm going to do it. <laughs> this is your the show reason, too, let's the go. Reason, you know, <laughs> the reason why I'm going to do it is, is this, right? So we had an author on, Alison Bechtel, right, who is this prominent, you know, lesbian comic, and she writes this amazing graphic memoir, Fun Home, right? And it gets published and picked up by a, you know, mainstream, you know, publisher. All of this attention, really great reviews, turned into a Tony Award winning musical, right, a few years later. And now Fun Home is being banned in K-12 wow. schools, oh. right? And so I was asking her, I was like, well, well, how do you feel about that? And she said something that so resonated with me. She's like, I... She's like, hey, I don't know how to process it. So I'm still processing it, right? To, to have had this and now to be back here again. But she said something that was like, mm, where she's like, I've never known how much I can trust. Oh, ouch. This visibility and all of these rights that we've been getting because it's always felt tenuous, right, to me. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm an associate VP of equity in, in Minnesota at a community college, you know, biggest community college in Minnesota. We're in the Twin Cities lots of protections, really queer friendly. But when I talk to my colleagues in outstate Minnesota, I mean, sometimes when I hear them telling me what they're going through, I'm like, it's still like 1990s where you're at up there, you know? And so I think there's this, I guess ultimately what I want to say about that, there's this weird dichotomy of folks, you know, and I, and I think like Brian and, you know, and, and I think we're experiencing a lot of the privileges, right? And we're able to live out and we're able to have our careers and we're able to, you know, experience all these things. And also at the same time, there's a lot of folks that aren't living that. And there's this weird dichotomy of that over the past 20 years. And now there's just this huge wave of legislative bans on all fronts, all fronts. Um, 
that are just ready to throw everything back into the early 20th century, if we're being honest here. But it is a wild thing to think about. And yeah, there, there there's my there's my take on it, I guess. Yeah, I want to just offer something there, JP. And I'm so glad that you reminded us and, and me in this particular moment of um, my lens is I've lived in New York City and Los Angeles and now Fort Lauderdale. Um, mm. So when I talk about people that look like me um, and have this you know, similar identity, I'm also thinking it th thinking of it through the lens of metropolitan cities that are tend to be more inclusive. Yeah. There are absolutely yeah. people who look like me in other places in our country that do not feel that way. Um, and so, you know, I, I also just want to acknowledge anyone who's listening who has that identity, like I see you as well. Um, and I know that there is work to do for all of us. And um, and I hope we get there. Um, and I, I really appreciate that story as well of, you know, I, um, I, I live in Fort Lauderdale. I actually try consciously try not to mention Florida. Um, I realize that it is the state. Um, and I get that question all the time. I have people, I have friends that won't visit me because of I live in Florida and they, they're like, I love you and I want to see you, but it's not going to be in Florida. Um, uh, is it because they're afraid of Florida, man? <laughs> well, there's, yes, it, you know, it's, I mean, there is a safety question, uh, yeah. you know, and yeah. so there, there is that. And yes, so it's, uh, um, I mean, and there have been times recently that I have also thought, hey, I've chosen to make, to like share my story um, so publicly. Mm -hmm. And is it going to be safe for me if this mm -hmm. legislation passes? Like what, what's that going to look like? And I have had those moments at 6'6". Six, six, I don't usually worry about my safety so much, but, um, but you know, I, but six, six doesn't help when you're faced with a gun. Right. And yeah. that is the reality yeah. that some, some members of our community are faced with um, in their lives and certainly around the world. So, um, hate is hate feels like it's emerging in ways that, that so many of us hoped that it wouldn't ever return. Um, and, uh, I hope that my belief is that this is the last stand for hate. Um, and uh, that the, the energy is fueled by the fact that those of us on the right side, quote unquote, of history are winning. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, thank you both so much for, for sharing all of that with everyone who's watching. And I think what's coming up for me as both of you are talking is we often conceive of progress as, as a line, right? So like we started at this point, we're going here and progress mm -hmm. looks like advancing along this axis when what we know is true of humans is when it comes to change and growth, we it might be two steps forward, one step back. It might be two steps forward, one step to the left, one step to the right. It, mm -hmm. It's not so simple, right? There's complexity in everything we do. And every time that there is a, uh, especially if we're framing things in wins and losses, right? If somebody's, quote, winning something, somebody else is out there thinking, I just lost. And then they'll come back and, and try to win again, right? And I think, you know, it's that kind of scarcity mindset. You know, we talk about so much in, in conflict resolution. Like we talk about expanding the pie, making things better for everyone. But not everybody wants a slice of pie. You know, not everybody wants that future. They, they want their what somebody like myself, perhaps people like us would say, like a, a, a narrower, uh, more bounded reality. And it's not for me to say whether that's right or wrong. Um, and I, I, I think that's really frustrating sometimes, especially when there's, I mean, I, I just look at all the things that both you and JP have gotten up to, like in terms of activism, in terms of your professional lives. And the amount of passion and energy and just like endurance that's gone into that, you know, it's like, it, it's really an incredible thing. And what's disheartening is there are people who are just as dedicated, just as passionate in making sure that people who identify as queer LGBTQIA plus or somebody that looks like me do not share the same advantages. Yeah, you know, I, I want to. Um, so first of all, I love what I get to do. I love this work. I would not trade it for anything else. Um, I work harder than I ever have in my life um, in this phase in my career, and it every day is exhausting. 
Um, and I wake up the next day and I can't wait to start again. Um, and I, I, maybe we could have a conversation with my therapist about whether this is good for me, but <laughs> a different story altogether. Um, and as you're all hearing, as I, I, I believe in levity in this because that's one, the, one of the ways that I get through this is I find humor in the, like this, the journey and the story. I, not humor in the plight of others because that is painful and I want to honor those experiences. And we have to find ways to, to navigate this journey in ways that allow us to have self-care and to, to, to keep our sanity. Um, and, you know, one of the things, and JP and I met today before this call for the first time, and uh, that one of the things, and I say that because one of the things that keeps me going, and particularly in those moments where I feel overwhelmed and exhausted, and I do say, can I get up tomorrow and do this again? is I know that there are people like JP out there and there are people like Enrico out there and people like my new colleague, Andrea, who just joined the Hummingbird team a couple of weeks ago and, 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 and that there is an army of us out there around the globe who are saying, we all deserve to be treated with respect. Everyone deserves to have their humanity honored um, and hate has no place in this world. Uh, and, I, you know, so then I say, you know what? I have to do my part because they're doing their part and together we're going to change things um, step by step, one day at a time. And you know, the other thing that keeps me going, and I had this you know, last week, I was I spoke on a panel uh, uh, about my disabilities, and uh, um, I had someone email me afterwards who shared because I'm one of the one of my experiences. I'm sober, and she reached out and she said, "I've never heard anyone in a public forum like that talk about their sobriety." Um, so it's those, it's knowing that there are others like the two of you out there. And it's knowing that there are people, even if it's a person that I've impacted. Um, and, and then sometimes I just got to find the humor or sleep. I love naps on the weekend. Um, you know, like it, it's, it, it's those different things that I find. And, uh, and sometimes we do feel like we're alone in this work. And if you're someone out there who feels like you're alone, um, I, that 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 feeling is real, and I'm not going to try to make it disappear. I will also say with confidence, you are not alone. There is someone out there who cares about you and loves you, and there's a whole world of people who are trying to make the world better for you. I love that. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the things that I've been reflecting on as I've been, um, you know, continuing my journey as a DEI professional is. I couldn't imagine being in another field where I met like so many just incredible and incredibly nice, warm people, you know, and sure, they're making it uh, their job to, you know, center humanity, but uh, you don't get into this line of work unless you really care, you know, and uh, something else that I've learned through podcasting, I know each of you are podcasters as well, is I'm kind of shocked at how, how open people are if you just reach across the void and say, hey, I'd like to meet you. There's so many people out there who are saying, you know what, I'd like to meet you too. And then that's the start of something. And yeah, more than uh, maintaining a professional reputation, uh, I think one of the things that keeps me going is like, oh, I can't let jp down i can't let brian down i gotta you know do what i can to make sure that everybody's being taken care of um well let's ask the the audience a question let's see what we got so um oh yes if you could coach your younger self through parts of your personal history what advice would you offer And, you know, I, I, this question comes from a place of love. You know, I, I'm somebody that um, one of the things that I'm working on in my own therapy is getting out of that uh, negative self-talk. You know, I'm my own mm -hmm. worst critic and everything. And so I often find myself in that space of I should have done this. I should have done this differently. And then it's my job from the president to be compassionate. Well, you couldn't know that, you know, so thinking through uh, how I could have made things better or how I can plot my course more clearly for the future. Uh, I, I have to treat my, my own self with the kind of love and compassion that I, I'm able to offer to others. So I don't know if that resonates with either one of you, if you'd like to answer the question. <laughs> it's, hmm. 
there was an immediate answer that came to my mind, and I haven't thought about this in a while, um, but it's it really appropriate for some of the things we talked that we're talking about in this conversation. One thing I want to say just before I answer the question is, I know earlier I talked about the HR and DEI professionals. I also just want to, like similar to what you said, Enrico, I love my HR community and I love my DEI community. These are people that want to make workplaces better for humans. Uh, and the training and skills don't necessarily serve the, the needs of today's in, uh, workplace in some ways. So it's not a it's it's a just an acknowledgement of the journey we're on, um, and uh, not a you know a, a intended to dismiss the important work that either of those groups do. Um, you know, and I think that you know this is this is one of those things that I you know that sort of you know connecting that back to this experience. There's two things that I'll share. One is the first answer that came to mind was. When the guy asks you, the senior executive, his name's Kevin Cunningham at Red Lobster or Darden Restaurant says, Brian, do you want to start the Pride ERG? I don't think we called it Pride back then. Maybe we did at Red Lobster. And I said, no, I don't want to be the gay HR guy. Say yes. <laughs> I wish I could go back and say yes. Um, uh, because it has. what I've learned is that my identity is not my detriment. It is my superpower. Um, and my stories mm -hmm. are the mm -hmm. things that allow me to be the great HR person or great DEI person and, and leaning into those conversations and learning. I think the other thing that um, I might have said to my younger self, because um, I've learned some of these skills over the over time, is um, there's such a parallel between DEI and HR work and therapy. And I always thought about going to school for therapy and to become for psychology. I did have take some psychology in college. I think I would have leaned into that more earlier because I do wonder how that would have influenced some of the decisions I made as an HR professional early in my career mm. that I wish I could go back and do differently today as I understand other humans in a different way. Um, I don't spend energy worrying about the things I did because I can't change them. Right. Um, but I just try to learn from them and say, like, I want to do it better going forward. And and that is one of those things, though, that I have learned since that time that I wish I would have leaned into more earlier. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. I don't think about things at all. Like, I'm very simple. Like, I just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it's exhausting to be in this brain, by the way. Um, <laughs> but it's, but it's also, I'm very, I'm very, grateful to have it as well. JP, <laughs> what about you? I, a little bit of what you're saying there really resonates, I think, with me of you get all these, I've heard about, you know, trauma, I mean, different types of metaphors of it, right? Or, you know, really negative experiences, kind of just like you have this wound that kind of gets frozen, mm -hmm. right, in you and that the point of the therapy is to help like thaw it so that it can, your body can release it. And I think that would be something that I would coach my younger self on is embracing that idea of, I don't have to en endure it. I don't have to carry it all with me, right? And to engage in a therapeutic relationship earlier on. And there's one particular modality that I, or protocol EMDR, which wasn't actually like a thing <laughs> when I would have needed it. Um, it sort of developed or, you know, much more so and, and providers have trained it and are, are more so like right now, but, um, to engage in that and to begin to let some th process some things and just kind of let it melt and thaw and let my have my body let it go, I think would have been really beneficial because then it would have helped me, I think, in that career journey, right, and the choices that I was making uh, early on, which was very kind of haphazard, right, because as a queer person, you're just sort of like... <laughs> I'm just going to do whatever right now, right? Because who knows what's going to happen, you know? So like that planning bit, you know, can take can take some time for some people. That's what, you know, mine was like. So I think that that really resonates with me about the engaging in a, in a therapeutic relationship early on to just have that time to say, that compassion to say, you know, you're okay. <laughs> and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to heal this and we're going to let it go. And it's going to be, in your past, right? It's not going to be this continuous present of constantly happening to you that we can we can heal that and let that go and kind of resource yourself so that you can move forward in a, in a more healthy way. Because like you said, I'm in a poly relationship and I sleep most of my Saturdays now at this point. <laughs> you know, my partners are like, do you want to do something? I'm like, yeah, I'm doing it right now. I'm <laughs> asleep on the couch and that's what I need, you know, right now. Um, so I know that feeling, right, Brian, of you kind of at the end of the day, you're like, ugh. And then you get up the next morning, you're like, we're going to get it done today, right? And that's a thing. That's a thing in these roles. And so having that, you know, 
those resources for you are really important, whether that's sleep, whether that's connections with other people, knowing that you and Enrico exist and are doing this work as well. It's all everything that you've said, clearly, as I keep going on and on, uh, are resonating <laughs> with me. So I love it. I love it. Well, and and I want I want to just offer something else that, that just to build on what you just shared of um, that a, a phrase that I've really embraced more and more. And it's not a judgment. It's just an acknowledgement of that hurt people hurt people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm, I, absolutely. you know, coming out, regardless of what part of the community you're part of, is a painful process and it involves mm -hmm. hurts and it involves um, a lot a collection of motions that if you don't have the chance to process, they go with you wherever you go. Mm -hmm. um, and I can, I've done a lot of work and it's really sobriety has been the, the journey that has made me a, a, a human that I really like and in love today. Um, it took me a long time to get there. I'm glad that I'm there today. Mm -hmm. um, and I can now see, I'm like, oh, I brought that to work. Um, mm, and, yeah. and, and I didn't want to, I didn't mean to, and I don't think anyone's blaming me for that. It's, um, again, I don't spend energy there, but I can I can see it in a, through a different lens now, um, and I do think these careers that are where we are, and actually I could say that it, this for people managers and leaders as well, uh, but certainly for HR professionals and DEI professionals and or, organizational development consultants or all of the people that are in this space that are working with humans, I think it is important for us to do work on ourselves um, so that way we can bring the best version of us to the work that we do. Um, and I wish I had gotten here more quickly, um, but I'm glad I'm here now. Yeah. Well, we're definitely glad to have you here now. Thank you. And before we we move on into our last kind of question area, I just want to affirm that one, sleep and rest are legitimate human activities. So if you're feeling what? the need for that, yeah, I know, I know. I just got the, the uh, somebody tweeted it at me today, so now I'm sharing it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But uh, just affirming that. But also, if you're somebody who, I, I was resistant to uh, seeing a therapist for a very long time. Um, but there's there's new stuff out there. So if you were thinking, if you had this one idea of this is what therapy is, it might not even be that anymore. So mm -hmm. so check it out. You know, uh, I, we're social creatures. We all need help sometimes, as as you know, my uh, colleagues here have said multiple times. Um, don't be a prideful ass. You know, I was, I still am sometimes working on it in therapy. So uh, <laughs> back to you, JP. <laughs> No, I think that's a really that's a, that is a really fundamental point. Like when you do an intake with a new therapist, it's as much an audition for them as it is for you. True. Right. And if you're not getting a good vibe, thanks. You know, it, it, you're not getting charged for that. You know what I mean? So finding that that person who clicks with you and will, you know, you're like, yes. And finding that modality. And there's a lot of interesting modalities now. Um, I don't know if that's the right word, but like things that you can do, whether that's, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. So you're doing that traditional like talk therapy, you're doing art therapy, you're doing EMDR uh, as a way of processing things, which I'm a big fan of because I tend to over intellectualize, mm. as you probably can tell right now. And EMDR just completely short circuits that so I can get in my body. Right. So I think that's really important to know that there are other ways of doing therapy now and that it's as much an audition for them. You know, you're hiring that person to help you. And if you're not feeling it, then you, you find the next person. So it's like hiring a, a coach. If you work with the coaches in the corporate environment of and the, the only thing I would build on, because I agree with everything that Enrico and JP has said is um, and I'm, I love the word like went into this conversation because I battle anxiety and depression and like talking about it and not letting like the, the stigma of it like guide my journey. Getting help is important. Um, and 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 calling it what it is is important and it's not nothing to be ashamed of um but the, the thing i would build on is um uh and i didn't understand this early on i used to think about when i was you know, picking a therapist or i've had a chance to work with some coaches it was like did i like them liking them is irrelevant mm -hmm. uh it is will i listen to them is the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and and that uh, and I have a therapist now. Um, I have a big personality, as I'm sure you figured out in this conversation. And uh, she does not let me get by with my stuff. She'll be like, Brian, we're going to stop you right there. <laughs> that, that is that is flawed thinking. Let's talk. Let's dial that back and talk about it. And uh, her name's Robin. And I am so grateful to have someone who just calls me on my stuff uh, mm -hmm. because that's what I'm paying her for. I'm paying for her to help me feel better, not to to help me do better not to always necessarily feel better although that comes with the territory 
Yeah, great points. And, uh, you know, just to really drill down there, that's also what people are hiring us for, you know, to call them on their stuff. They don't always want us to do that after, uh, you know, we've signed the contract, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. that's what we're here to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, they don't always like it. Uh, no. Yeah, we were, we were talking about that, before, I think, right before you, you joined our prep call, JP, of I was with a client earlier today and um, and the emotions came up uh, because I said some honest stuff. And so some anger came out and, you know, it's it, we were doing a, a survey debrief and that's OK. Like it's OK for those humans to have those emotions because I'm telling them stuff that's uncomfortable. My job is to make people uncomfortable. I also absolutely believe through discomfort is where we ignite change. So let's make it happen. One quick thought to that. Something that a colleague once told me doing contract work is they're like, you know, you can cancel the contract, right? <laughs> if you're getting to a point where you're hitting your head against the wall, there's a clause. You can just say, you know what? We're good. And, you know, say that they maybe need to work with somebody else on that. And that was a freeing thought for me. But I'm looking at the time and Enrico, should we go to that last question even though i don't want to i want to keep going here <laughs> but we're the question's about the future right so should we do that or do we still have time yeah let's go for like another five ten minutes something like that okay so uh brian so if we're thinking about the future and you've got your book coming out like what do you what do you hope for your book and for your consultancy and for hummingbird humanity like when your book is coming out developing a human-centered culture what do you what are you hoping for it in the future uh, yeah, uh, well, thanks for reminding people about my book again, because, um, again, I still can't believe we can say Brian McCormick wrote a book. Um, um, I, I, I envision um, a workplaces of the future that are welcoming and inclusive to everyone, where, where everyone can bring their unique skills and capabilities and experience to the better of that organization and the work they do. I see that possibility, um, even in light of like the legislation you've mentioned, JP, or the hate that we've seen around the world. Um, certainly, I want to acknowledge the, our, the Iranian women and the, the Jewish community, mm -hmm. and the hate that's being spewed at those communities right now, which is unwarranted. Um, you know, the, I, I, I I do hope we get past all of that, um, and I hope that the, the 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 message of my book ignites a conversation. You know, the the book is framed through this lens of I won't pretend like I have a point of view, but I don't pretend that I have all the answers. Um, I I that, that that would be a highly ego driven message then. Um, and uh, while I do know I have a a, a good mind. I'm also learning every single day. So the book is really an invitation to reflect on a different possibility. And I hope it sparks conversation and reflection at, in boardrooms and in C-level rooms and uh, with leaders and managers that, that, that they figure out in their own way, whether it's the way I've suggested or not, that how do we help work the, our workplaces be environments where humans thrive and that business benefits or the organization benefits. So you know, that's what I hope for. Um, you know, and I shared with you all earlier, um, I, I also just want to be part of the change. So that's part of my hope um, and mm -hmm. desire for the future. And uh, we're, we'll be launching, a, launching uh, the, the, the legal name will be the Hummingbird Humanity Foundation. We're, we're still thinking about what the what the actual name will be, but we're launching a nonprofit to focus on bringing diversity to education because uh, that is so important. Um, our stories in the LGBTQ plus community should not be erased um, from education. Um, it's okay to talk about heterosexual relationships and it's also okay to talk about homosexual relationships and all of the variations in between. Um, and, uh, and, and we should do it in age appropriate ways, of course, hmm, but, yeah. um, but we don't have to hide those stories. Um, and so I want to be part of that change as well. So th those are just some of the things that, that I hope for that, that we can continue. Um, and I'll leave, I guess I'll la land on this thought, which is, you know, I believe in what, how we work at Hummingbird is we try to ignite shared humanity. So uh, the three of us are here because we're all members of a community that we connect with and we that we have we have ways that that we can find bridges. And we also have very different stories. Mm. Um, and so through I mean, and you just shared a moment ago that you're in a polyamorous relationship, JP, I can only imagine how some people don't feel how they feel about that relationship. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And, you know, like, I <laughs> I'm like, well, I'd like to learn more about you because we built a connection through shared humanity and shared experiences. And I'm like, 
I don't really get it necessarily, but that who cares? Like, it's more about like, I'd like to understand more about your experience. And that's our goal and hope at Hummingbird is to ignite that shared humanity that opens the door for everyone to understand the individual lived experiences of others. So we can break down those barriers to um, um, to growth and progress, um, eliminate systemic oppression so that way everyone can thrive. I love that. And you know, uh, somebody that you work closely with, uh, Ben Green, just did a uh, a. He's community not, don't, don't mention him. He's really no, he's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Ben, ben is the one of the most spectacular humans on the planet. I totally guess. Uh, I agree. Like, and very quotable. So something that yeah. he said in our community event the other day was, um, "Understanding can come at day one, day ten, or day one hundred, as long as respect comes at day one." And it's like I keep thinking about that. It's so good. Um, I, I do have to end the session right now. I'm sorry. It's been a wonderful mm. conversation uh, between all of us. I, I've really, mm -hmm. really enjoyed this. Uh, and who knows? Maybe we could figure out something else we could all do together. I know. I know. I would love it. Um, yes. Come JB, in, of course. <laughs> fantastic. As long as so you laughed at my jokes, I'm, I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> You're a funny guy. Uh, well, JP, do you have anything you'd like to say as we're kind of closing out here? Well, to all of the This Queer Book Save My Life listeners and viewers today, I really hope that you will subscribe to DEI Is Podcast. This conversation is just but a sample of what you can hear in the other episodes in their library. And to all of the DEI Is listeners, I hope you come and check us out here at This Queer Book Save My Life. Uh, we are about, yes, queer books, but we're about sharing those stories, right, Brian, to your point about how are we sharing and telling our stories and what we can learn about that from each other. So thank you for having us here today, Enrico. And um, hopefully we'll see each other very soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone.